going to do a reading, and I'm going to go to prayer. I'm going to go to 1 Peter. I'm going to read verses 3 through 9, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 13. I'm going to read through verse 21. A little on the long side, but um, this came through in my Bible app this morning, and and, uh, it really, um, really encapsulated what it means to have faith and the rewards as a result of that faith. So I just wanted to share that with you this morning. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power, until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all types of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even through, though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor. When Jesus Christ is revealed, though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Very important. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. And he's, never, he's not saying that, you know, an empty way of life, it doesn't mean we don't care about generating income to support our families. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's not important for moms that raise their children. You know, what Peter's saying is it's all about perspective. It's perspective. The reality is found in Christ, and through that reality, we do these things. Because independent of Christ, independent of that salvation that's been given to us, everything we do on this earth is meaningless. In Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. It's a chasing after the wind. So it's all, just as we go to prayer this morning, just remember the perspective that we need to have as we live our lives. It's not that our day-to-day life isn't important, but in the grand scheme of things, we've got to have Christ in our life. We've got to remember that we've been redeemed. We've got to remember that we have that grace and mercy. We've got to remember that that salvation is sewn up for us because of our faith. That's the most important thing because at the end of the day, when we go to see with him, when we go to be with him, that's where it's all about. Amen? So, Lord, we just thank you for this day and this opportunity to serve you today. Lord, we need you every day. We praise you. We love you. And there are days, Lord, where we do feel separated from you, Lord. Where there are days where we're stressed out and we're hurting and we're, we're struggling with certain things and we have vices that we deal with day in and day out and then the, the enemy comes and gives us guilt and shame. And, but, Lord, you are there for us. 
Your word is there for us. Your spirit is there for us. We thank you. We thank you for your son who not only died for us in our stead that we may have a relationship with you, but was raised to be with the right hand of the Father, Lord, so that we can have life, so that we can have hope. And that is not taken away from us, Lord, not because of anything that we've done, because of who you are, Lord. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the creator of all things, heaven and earth. We thank you and we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's let Edward Winslow tell you. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling. That so we might, after a special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. They four in one day killed as much fowl as, with a little help beside, served the company almost a week. At which time, amongst other recreations, we exercised our arms, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, with some 90 men, whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor and upon the captain and others. And although it be not always so plentiful as it was at this time with us, Yet, by the goodness of God, we are so far from want that we often wish you partakers of our plenty. Everyone here that had anything to do with the weekend, uh, you were in the opening ceremony, you were on a float, just to stand. And all I want to do is just to let you know the number of people that serve behind the scenes in all areas, and we could name all the areas. But now, we want to honor who's honored due. Let's give a clap offering to God, the, to the one who makes it all possible, to the one who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank him for all that he's done. Amen. Praise God. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you enjoyed Russell Williams playing on the waterfront with that uh, piano? Well, Russell is coming with his daughter, and they're going to do a special for us.
You may be seated. I want to uh, My wife and I were at a conference up in Northfield, Massachusetts for the rededication of the Moody campus, Dwight Moody, and I was not dressed like this, but I tried to dress like Dwight Moody. I was supposed to um, reenact one of his sermons. And um, we, were, we were up there, and when we were at a meeting, a man was introduced. It uh, ran a, an academy for training preachers. And we went up and got to know him a little bit, and um, he had just uh, mentioned of individuals that he had been working with around the country. And so when I came back... Um, we were, Ollie and I were talking and saying, hey, look, we, we need to get somebody to reenact Martin Luther King's speech. We had some things planned, but they didn't work out. So I called him up and I said, listen, uh, do you know anybody that uh, reenacts Martin Luther King's speech? He's like, I got the perfect person for you. He says, you got to get a hold of Joseph T. Howard out of Atlanta, Georgia, which I did. And when he started to email me back, you know, now sometimes when you read an email, you read an email. Sometimes when you read an email, you're getting a sermon. And I said, I like this guy already. <laughs> I haven't met him yet. And um, we began to talk. I, I found out that, you know, he's the youth pastor at Mount Olivet Missionary Baptist Church, but he's also the associate pastor of Mount Ephraim Baptist Church. Now, I have enough on my plate to pastor one church. How are you doing both those? And not only that, he's very busy. And he told me, he said, I, 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 I love, you know, to give the speeches, but I found out something that's more important than reenacting the past. He loved Jesus. And he's passionate about his word. And he's passionate about the church of Jesus Christ. And the church of Jesus Christ in these days doing what the church should do. And that's what we need. That's what we love. And he also told me, I'm, a, I'm just a whisper under 30. I said, well, I'm just a cough over 30. <laughs> Let's welcome Joseph Howard to our podium here to deliver the Word of God. Praise God. Glad to have you here, my brother. We've become friends now, and I said, you know, when this happens, it's not the last we'll see of each other now. Amen. No problem with that. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Good. <laughs> Thank you for the offer, though. I appreciate it. Amen. Good morning, New Testament Church. It's God be the glory for the great things he has done. I stand before you giving all praise, honor, and glory to God, who is the head of my life. Without him, I would be nothing, I would know nothing, I would have nothing, and truly nothing else would matter. And I am grateful that he has allowed me to see another day, and I am honored to be here with each and every one of you. Before I go any further, I want to give God praise for your wonderful pastor, the one who serves this church faithfully. Can we put our hands together and give God praise for Dr. Paul Jaley? God bless you, sir. And I thank you for extending this invitation, not just for me to come and recite the speech, but also for me to preach a word from the Lord. And to everybody who makes up this wonderful congregation, to all of the members, to the wonderful praise team and the musicians and everyone in their respective place, I have truly enjoyed myself thus far. And this has been a tremendous weekend. I was telling uh, Dr. Jaley and Ali and a few others that Plymouth is one of America's best kept secrets. And that's a shame since it's America's hometown but definitely more people need to be here and experience the love that you all have. And I want to thank you for sharing that with me. I bring you greetings from the Mount Ephraim Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia, where my pastor is the Reverend Dr. R. L. White Jr. And I additionally bring you greetings from the Mount Olivet Missionary Baptist Church in Rockmart, Georgia, where I am blessed to serve as the youth pastor under the leadership of the Reverend Cord Franklin Sr. And I do fly back to Atlanta this evening, but I am grateful that I get to fellowship with you all for a little bit. And I want to thank all of the friends and the family that I've made over the past couple of days. Y'all are stuck with me now. Uh, so this will not be, as he said, the last time that you see me. But I want to thank you for your hospitality, for your generosity, and just your overall kindness. Well, I'm going to get right into the word. I'm just going to be about three hours, and then I'll be right out of your way. Uh, but before I get to the message, I do want to tell you all a little story of a friend of mine. I know a preacher who preached a three-night revival at a church in Atlanta. And at the end of the first night, a young lady came up to him and said, Preacher, 
you're something else. The man was like, okay, well, thank you. I appreciate it. The next night of the revival comes. He preaches his sermon. And the young lady, the same young lady, comes up to him again and says, preacher, you're something else. The preacher's a little perturbed at this point. He's like, okay, I don't know what you mean, but appreciate you. So the third night of the revival comes. The preacher preaches his sermon. And the same lady comes up to him and says, preacher, you are something else. The preacher at this point has had enough. And he looks at her and says, you've been telling me this every single night. What do you mean I'm something else? The young lady looks at him and says, well, you've got to be something else because you're definitely not a preacher. <laughs> so if somebody comes up to me today and tells me I'm something else, please clarify what you mean. Please and thank you. Amen. Amen. If you would please bow with me for a brief word of prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy and your unmerited favor. Thank you, Lord, for being God and God all by yourself. Besides you, O oh Lord, there is none other. And for that, God, we are grateful. As we just sang, Lord, we are desperate for you. We are lost without you. God, without you, we can do nothing. And God, we thank you that you are there for us, even when we're not there for you. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, please move me out of self. Let this message be all about you and you alone. Please open the hearts of your people here that they may receive this message and somehow be blessed by it and be able to apply it to their lives. And now as David prayed in the 19th Psalm, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. As is my custom, I would ask that all those who are able, please stand to your feet out of reverence for the reading of God's word. There are two scriptures that I would like for us to take note of on this morning. Both are fairly familiar passages. First, the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 40. I'll be reading verses 29 through 31. And then the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and verse number 5. Again, Isaiah, chapter 40, beginning at verse number 29. And then the Gospel of John, chapter 15, and verse number 5. I'll be reading from the New King James translation, Isaiah chapter 40, beginning at the 29th verse, God's word declares, he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And then if you flip over to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, you will find these words recorded in verse number five. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, for just a few moments, or those three hours, like I said, I would like to preach through a simple question. Are you plugged in? Are you plugged in? There's a story of an inventor who created this amazing machine that he claimed would change the world. He claimed that this machine contained power and abilities that no other machine in history could match. The inventor invited the press along with a group of scholars to his laboratory to unveil this trailblazing machine. When everybody got there and the inventor unveiled it, he then said, prepare to be amazed and he hit the power switch. Nothing happened. 
The inventor was confused and a bit embarrassed, so he hit the power button again. Nothing happened. The crowd started to whisper as this was not the amazing display that they were promised. The inventor is dumbfounded as he hits a bunch of buttons and even opens up the machine to make sure everything is working fine on the inside. But each time he hits the power button, he keeps getting the same result. Nothing. Meanwhile, the janitor happened to be walking by with his mop and his bucket, and he casually walks up to the inventor and asks, what's the problem? The inventor acts as if he couldn't be so bothered with the janitor, and he angrily replies, leave me alone. My invention doesn't work. The janitor says, well, I can help you fix it. I know exactly what's wrong. The inventor laughs at him in mocking fashion, and the crowd follows suit. The inventor then says, I'm a brilliant inventor. I've won awards. I've traveled the nation. I'm a genius. And you, well, you're a janitor. So you stick to mopping floors, and I'll handle the real work. So another hour goes by, and everyone has tried everything they can think of in order to get the machine to work. Finally, the janitor says once again, I know what's wrong. I can fix it for you. So the inventor rolls his eyes and says, fine, you're so brilliant with your mop and your bucket. Knock yourself out. Fix this machine. So the janitor cracks a smile, gently sets down his mop and bucket, and walks behind the machine and plugs it in. He then looks at the inventor whose jaw has now dropped and says, try it now. The inventor bows his head in shame and embarrassment because as brilliant as he perceived himself to be, he forgot the simple task of making sure his machine was plugged in. Family, many of us are just like that inventor when it comes to our relationship with God. We recognize that we are gifted, talented, and endowed with abilities. We recognize that we have many wonderful things at our disposal, but we forget the simple task of making sure that we are connected to our power source. I don't merely mean an electrical outlet that you plug in, but I mean connected to God, connected to the Holy Spirit, spiritually connected through a relationship with Jesus Christ. We try everything and everyone else, and we think that being connected to them is more beneficial. But when someone tries to direct us to connect to God, we want to ignore them because we think we know what we're doing. But life has a way of teaching us that our connection to God is what makes the difference. And many of us assume that we have the right connection when in actuality we have no connection at all. And just like there comes a time when we need to make sure that inanimate objects are properly plugged in, there comes a time where we need to stop and honestly ask ourselves if we are plugged in to our power source. Part of our text this morning is a familiar passage presented to us by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is one of what's called the major prophets, which means that the book is one of the larger books in the Old Testament in terms of chapters. We're coming towards the end of the book as we arrive at this text, and the prophet is taking this time to comfort God's people. He spent the majority of the book of Isaiah prophesying judgment and rebuke upon Israel, but now his tone changes as he also lets them know that God has their back. In fact, one of my favorite verses is found just one verse earlier in verse 28, which says, do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. This verse alone gives us a glimpse into the power that our God possesses. It confirms for us that he is indeed our source because he is the only one who can accurately claim to be the creator of the whole world. He's the only one who can accurately say that they never grow faint or weary, and he's definitely the only one for whom there's no limit to his understanding. Is this, and this is why it's important for us to make sure that we are plugged in 
Because many of us put our trust in people and things, thinking that they have the power to save us. But no matter how much we love somebody or something, and no matter how much we may depend on somebody or something, they will eventually let us down in some way, shape, or form. There's only so much that a human being can do. And that verse that we just read says that God has no limit to under his understanding, but people have limits to their understanding. The verse says that God never grows faint or weary, but people grow faint and weary. The verse says that God is the creator of all flesh and he's everlasting, which means his power and existence will never come to an end. But people's power and existence will come to an end. So no matter how amazing or great we perceive somebody to be, even they have weaknesses and limitations. But Isaiah is telling us that God has no weaknesses. God has no limitations and God can cannot be stopped by anybody or anything. And so this is why we need to make sure that we are plugged in to this awesome and amazing God that we serve. But how do we make sure that we're plugged in? I'm so glad you asked. Y'all asked some awesome questions. We must first ask ourselves some crucial questions. How often do we pray? How often do we read God's word? How often do we consult God before we do something? How often do we consider God and what he desires for us? You see, these are just some of the ways that we stay plugged into God. We need to make him our priority, not merely an option, not merely a last resort, but the only source that we prioritize. That's why Richard Smallwood wrote the masterpiece that says, you are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. I lift my hands in total praise to you. And family, let me give you a hint. Total praise means that nobody else receives that praise. Acknowledging God as the source means that we recognize that all we need comes from him. And that's why Isaiah says in our text, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. In other words, nothing that's plugged into God will remain in the same condition. Nothing connected to the Lord will stay in the same shape. When we are weak, God has the strength that we need. When we're down, God is the one who can lift us up. When we're confused and don't know which way to turn, God is the one who can regulate our minds. That's why somebody said he's a burden bearer, a heavy load sharer, a heart fixer, and a mind regulator. Nobody else can lay claim to this. And that's why the songwriter said, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. He's my friend. Now, one thing about me is that I love networking. I enjoy connecting with others and establishing relationships and partnerships. And like I said, I got a new family here. So y'all are stuck with me, like I said. But I really enjoy connecting with people. I've especially found this to be beneficial in ministry because despite some of the crazy characters you encounter amongst preachers, and Dr. Jaley can attest to this, right? There are some crazy people that call themselves preachers, but that's another sermon. But it's always a blessing to come in contact with like-minded people that you can grow and work together with. Not only that, I'm grateful for mentors that God has placed in my life who have poured into me and presented me with opportunities that have helped me grow as a servant of the Lord. However, as much as I appreciate those connections, I'd be foolish to not acknowledge who made it all possible. The only reason I've been able to do anything I've done is because of my connection to God. You see, a few years ago, it got back to me that a local pastor who thought that they knew me was talking about me behind my back and said that I thought that I was all of that and that I felt I was well connected when in actuality, there's not much to me at all. When I was told this, my first inclination was to lash out, but then I thought about something. This person was right about one thing. I am well connected, well connected to God well connected to the Holy Spirit, well connected to the blood, and he's the only reason anything has happened for me. 
You see, I know I'm not perfect. In fact, I say this all the time back home. I'm just as messed up as anybody else, if not more. But God has still blessed me better than anyone or anything could ever try to do. God opened the doors. All I did was show up. And family, we need to learn to thank God for the doors that he has opened for us. We need to learn how to give God the glory for all that he does. Not only that, but we also need to praise him for who he is. We shouldn't just be plugged into God for what we can get out of him, but our devotion should also be out of appreciation and loyalty. Young people, just like we shouldn't only love and honor our parents because we want something, God deserves the same type of unconditional love and devotion just because he's God, just because he's good, just because of who he is. That's why the songwriter said, because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Now, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, or as another translation says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, you will hear me say every time I get up to preach, like I said this morning, without him, I would be nothing, I would know nothing, I would have nothing, and nothing else would matter. Now, I started saying that randomly a few years ago, and it's stuck with me ever since. It used to be just a little catchphrase I said so that people would remember me, but now it's a reminder that I refuse to let myself forget. Because as the text says, we must abide in him, which means obey him, live according to his will, Keep him first in all that we do. And as Matthew 6.33 tells us through Jesus, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And Jesus promises that those who abide in him will produce much fruit. This means that as God uses us and as we operate within his will, he will bring about beautiful results. But in order to get these results, we must be plugged in, family. We can't expect God to constantly bless us, and yet we're not even connected to him. Kind of like our cell phones can't charge unless they're plugged in. We can't bear any fruit if we don't abide in the Lord. As the text says, apart from him, we can do nothing. So no matter how great we may think we are, no matter how talented we may think we are, and no matter how much money we may have in our pockets, without God, we can do absolutely nothing. Just like we can't breathe without air, we can't do anything without God. Just like we can't drive our cars without gas, we can't live without God. Just like a plant can't grow without water, or a human can't live without food, or a heart can't beat without blood, we cannot live without the Lord. That's why when I hear hymns like, I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour, that doesn't just mean I need God to pay my bills. That doesn't just mean I need him to heal my body. That doesn't just mean I need him to wake me up each morning or bless me with whatever I need, but I need him just to exist. I need him just to function. I need him to make it from day to day. That's why Acts 17 and 28 says, in him we live and move and have our being. We wouldn't exist without him, y'all, and we need to be grateful and abide in him. But I dare not go any further without warning us not to neglect our spiritual connection. That's why I've posed the question of, are we plugged in? You see, many of us are plugged in, but we're not plugged into the right connection. You see, instead of being plugged into God, some of us are plugged into people. Some of us are plugged into money. Some of us are plugged into stuff and popularity and approval from finite human beings. In other words, our loyalty and devotion are not to God, but rather to other people and things. And this is dangerous because there's only so much that others can do for us. As I've said before, I'm grateful for network working and connections. I'm grateful for family, friends, and contacts, but none of them are meant to be a substitute for God. Nobody is ever supposed to take God's place. And while it's nice to know people and have people know us, the real question is, do we know God? 
And not only that, are we connected to God? You see, there was a time as a preacher where I wanted to get to know as many pastors as I could. I wanted to get my name out there. I wanted people to know who I was and what I could do. But God had to convict me big time because my focus was all the way off. Our lives should never be about receiving recognition from people. You see, there's nothing wrong with enjoying it. I love words of affirmation. In fact, that's my primary love language for anybody who's familiar with the five love languages. But I have to keep in mind that at the end of the day, all that matters is what God thinks. And many of us base our opinions of ourselves on what people think. In school, our young people only feel special when the popular kids like them or include them, or they're the ones receiving awards or being praised for their accomplishments. People in the church want to be so important that they try to get as close to the pastor or other leaders as they can because they figure if the pastor knows who they are, they'll be all right. And just like I used to do, some people try to get close to whoever they can and try to get in good with the right people, thinking that that will somehow increase their worth and value. But family, God's attention is the only attention we will ever need. He is more than enough. Not only that, he's the only one who still loves us even when people that we're trying to impress turn us away. And look at it like this. Why would we try to impress a human being with some money when we can connect to God who owns all the money? Why, why would we try to get validation and acceptance from finite human beings when we've already been created and accepted by the one true and living God who created the heavens and the earth? Why would we spend our time and energy trying to please people when we can use that same energy and that same time to please God who deserves it way more than anybody else? Family, we need to check our connection. We need to check our priorities. You see, if our connection is right, then our thoughts and priorities will be right also. So if you're here today and you haven't been considering God, you haven't been putting God first, and you haven't acknowledged God as your true source, perhaps it's time that you check your connection and make sure that you're plugged in. Earlier this year, my wife and I were blessed to travel to Israel, otherwise known as the Holy Land. We spent an amazing two weeks exploring the land where many of the events we read about in the Bible took place, including the birth ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. During our flight home, we had a layover in Paris, France, followed by a nine and a half hour flight from there back to Atlanta, where I live. During this long flight, I decided to take this time to charge my Apple devices, which are my iPhone and my iPad. Now, each of the seats on the plane were equipped with outlets, so I charged my phone first and then proceeded to plug in my iPad. After a few minutes, I looked at my iPad only to discover that there was a message on the screen that said, not charging. It was plugged in, just like my phone was, and although my phone charged up just fine, for some reason, my iPad wasn't charging at all. I kept unplugging and plugging it back in, but nothing was working. I then started to panic because I thought something was wrong with my iPad, and I didn't want to have to replace it because iPads are very expensive. So fast forward a few hours later, we land back in Atlanta, and I have cell service again, so I use my phone to Google why my iPad won't charge. And y'all, I got happy when I read the answer. The answer said, and I quote, the only time your iPad will not charge is if the source it's connected to is not strong enough. And family, how many of us are not charging because the sources we are connected to aren't strong enough? How many of us aren't growing and progressing because we are connected to weak outlets? You see, this is why God wants to make sure that we are properly connected to him. Because we can be plugged into people all day long. We can have friends, connections, and contacts all day long. But if the source isn't strong enough, we're not going to grow at all. 
Family, God is calling us to grow. God is calling on us to mature. God is calling on us to do better. And this is why we can't be plugged into just anybody, but we need to be plugged into the main source, the only source. Some of us wonder why we're not growing. Some of us wonder why we're not doing better than we are, why we're not where we think we should be. But I challenge us to check our connection. I challenge us to make sure that we are plugged in and that the plug is secure. Don't just plug into anybody because you see an outlet. Because just because you can plug into something doesn't mean that something has any power. Kind of like when you see a power outlet and you try to plug something in only to discover that it doesn't work. There are many people, y'all, who look powerful, but in actuality, they're not. So I assure you today that if you plug into God, He's got power every time. If you plug into God, he is able every time. If you plug into God, he'll charge you right up. And no matter how many times your battery gets low, he'll never hesitate to strengthen you. He'll never hesitate to pick you up. He'll never hesitate to turn you around and place your feet on solid ground. And family, there are benefits to being plugged in. There are advantages to being plugged in. You see, it's one thing to be connected to someone with some power. But when you connect to God, you connect it to the one with all power in his hands. Raw power, supernatural power, Holy Ghost power, wonder working power, power to deliver, power to heal, power to protect, power to set free. He has all power in his hands. And family, I encourage you to connect to the Lord while you still have a chance. Plug yourself in while you still have a chance. We can plug into other folks, but they will let us down. We can plug into other folks, but they will eventually run out of power. We can plug into other folks, and they will eventually come to the end of their ability. But I dare you to plug into Jesus. I dare you to plug into the Lord. I dare you to plug into to the blood of Jesus. And y'all, there's something special about the blood of Jesus. You see, our text says that God gives power to the weak. But then I heard a songwriter say there is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb. And then I heard another songwriter said, oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus, it will never lose its power. I heard another songwriter said, his blood still works, and I'm glad to report that it's never lost its power. Yes, it works, and I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And then one more songwriter said it like this, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never, ever lose its power. Come on and put your hands together and give God some praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So if you didn't get anything from my message today, ask yourself, I hear a couple of chuckles, so hopefully you got something, but ask yourself, are you truly plugged in? It's nice to be in church, it's nice to be active, it's nice to know Bible verses, but it's even nicer to know Jesus Christ. You see, I know a lot of people, they can quote every Bible verse, they know every stanza of the hymns, they even know the fancy choruses that nobody else knows but they don't seem to have a connection to Jesus Christ themselves. And it would be very tragic to go through your entire life thinking that you're plugged in, only to stand before him and hear those dreaded words, depart from me, I never knew you. But here's the good part, y'all. Jesus is available. He's standing right there with open arms. He doesn't care what you've done. He doesn't care what you're doing right now. He doesn't even care what you're going to do in the future. He just wants to know that you and him have a right relationship. So I'm about to pray for us, and then I'll invite Dr. Jaley to come up here to extend the invitation. But I want you to think right now. 
Ask yourself honestly, are you truly plugged into the Lord? Don't worry about who's around you. Don't worry about who's looking at you. Don't worry if people look at you funny or whisper about you or post about you on social media because this is your soul salvation. Nobody has a heaven or a hell to put you in. And at the end of your life, when you stand before God and he asks, why didn't you plug into me? Why didn't you devote to me? He doesn't want to hear, well, the people at the church were looking at me funny. Or the people at my school were looking at me funny. I wanted to stay in good graces with them. I wanted to go along with what they think. No, no, no. Uh Uh-uh. God is more important. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You'll either love the one or hate the other. And I might get teased. I might get talked about. I might get excluded from certain circles. But I'll take Jesus over man any day. Because anybody who knows Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you can testify. When humans let you down, Jesus is still there. When humans get tired of you, Jesus is still there. Even when you mess up and people get disappointed and cast you to the side, Jesus still says, I love you. He might have a thing or two to say to us. He might say, go and sin no more. But he'll still protect us. And he'll still keep us. So family, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you are pleased with your servant. Most most of all, oh God, I pray that you are pleased with our praise. Father, thank you for being that outlet that we can plug into. Thank you, God, for being that power source that gives us strength from day to day. Thank you, God, for sending your son to die on the cross that we may have the right to the everlasting tree of life. Thank you, Lord, for his blood that reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley, that blood that gives us strength and that blood that will never lose its power. Thank you, God, for each person here under the sound of my weak voice. Lord, you know what each and every person is dealing with. You know, God, what each of them pushed past to get here on today. You know what burdens they are carrying. So, Father, I ask you to release your Holy Spirit. Move up and down the aisle. Go into every heart, every home, every family, and every situation. Father, if somebody is sick, I ask you to heal their bodies. Lord, if somebody has a need, I ask you to provide. Father, if somebody is depressed or dealing with grief or grudges or some sort of confusion, I ask you to console them and strengthen them. And Father, if somebody here doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, I ask you to prick their heart right now, disturb their comfort level, and let them know that without you, they can't do anything. Father, I thank you, God, for this church. I thank you, God, for this community. I pray for Dr. Paul Jelly and the New Testament church family and all of those connected to it. I ask you to bless and prosper and protect this church. Help this church to be a shining light for you in this dark world and in these dark times. Because, Father, we know that there is no sickness that you can't heal. There is no situation that you can't fix. And there is no problem that takes you by surprise. So have your way in this place. And, Lord, we repent for all that we have said, done, or thought that is contrary to your will. But we thank you, God, for giving us a chance each day to make it right. And, Father, please save somebody on today. If somebody here, even if they just came because it's this holiday weekend, speak to somebody's heart. Make somebody brand new. Give them the courage to walk out and say, I need you, Lord. I can't go on without you. My battery is low. I can't make it. Because, God, we know that once you charge us up, we'll never lose our power. Once you charge us up, we will never be the same. Once you charge us up, God, we will not be in the same shape that we were before. Thank you, Father. We love you, God. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you all. God bless you. And thank you so much. Amen. Hallelujah. I've been in the South. He's the real deal. Now, we have not learned how to respond. But praise God, the most important thing right now, before we pray for just a couple of things and close the service, is a challenge to you personally. Are you plugged in? Have you ever plugged in? So let's just wait before God for just a couple of minutes. You can bow your head if you feel to, but just to to wait. In a few minutes, there'll be those that will be up front to pray for you if you have any need. And if you're not sure... I urge you to come to talk to someone.
If you've just prayed and said, well, Lord, I want to connect to you, just tell the Lord, Lord God, I repent for my sin. I ask you to come into my heart. Change me, Lord. Then get prayer from someone. Don't leave here. Don't get refocused on all the kinds of things that are coming. If the Holy Spirit is moving on your heart, that is more important than anything else. So God, we ask you to complete that work. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So God, we just come before you now. And first of all, we thank you for the challenge this morning. And God, I pray if there's anyone whose heart is tugged, have I been plugged in? I pray, Lord, that you'd complete that tug on their hearts and have them know that they know when they leave this service that they know you. God, we pray for Leah, who is in the midst of right now of an amazing tragedy that no one even knows how to describe. And God, we pray that you'd anoint her as she ministers to those thousand students and more. God, we pray that your church would rise up, that the individuals we know that have been here in this church that live in the area, some of whom have been evacuated, we pray for Kirk Cameron, who is evacuated. We pray for Ted Baer, a movie guide, who is uh, right near the fires, for Marshall Foster, who's just moved out of Thousand Oaks, but right near. God, we pray for these individuals, and we know there's many more, but we also, because we know them, but we also pray, God, that you would simply move through Leah, move through others, Lord, who are Samaritan's Purse and others that are on the ground ministering. We pray even locally, Lord, for our selectmen, not only here in Plymouth, but in the town of Bourne. We pray that the people have risen up and said, look, some, some, enough is enough. But we pray all of us who are citizens of that town would take responsibility. And we pray, God, that you would continue to anoint Linda as she spearheads this effort to make sure that the rule of law is really followed. And God, we pray for Bob Weiner. We pray that you'd touch him physically, Lord. Lord, you know every situation. You know what was happening there. You know all the situations. We pray for Rose. We pray, God, that you would uh, give her strength, give her family strength as they rally around him. And God, we thank you that you, have, you know all things, Lord, and you have all things under control. So, God, we pray for any in this congregation that need a touch from you. We pray that we'd continue to seek you, live and move plugged in to you. And we'll thank you now. Send us to the mission field. Lord, send us the field of service where you have us that we might influence the garden you've placed us in. And we'll thank you, Lord, and send us plugged in to your power and your spirit. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said... Amen. Thank you. God bless. Greet one another, but please do so not at the altar, but a little bit back so that those who do pray are able to do so. God bless you. Go in the name of the Lord.